like to look at reactions of the side chains in benzene derivatives with you guys. Well, there's three essential reactions that we're going to be learning in this chapter. The first is permanganate oxidation. We've seen oxidation with permanganate before when we've talked about forming diols of alkenes and oxidative cleavage. So when we're talking about permanganate oxidation here, we have to look at the position that's attached to the ring. So these two positions here, these are called benzylic positions. So those are the carbons that are going to get oxidized. So in um, concentrated hot basic um, 100 degrees Celsius, right, something warm, um, these carbons can get oxidized to carboxylates. So they form COO minuses. And then this CH3 gets further oxidized also. So that turns into a carboxylic acid as well. And what we're left with is this carboxylic acid, and then what we simply do is we do an acid work up here to form um, the full carboxylic acid. Other thing to point out here is that you have an activated ring, and then over here you have become deactivated. Well, we've seen this reaction in previous chapters, so side chain halogenation. So if we take benzene and with a substituent, an alkyl substituent, and add bromine, NBS, with a little bit of light, we'll get a side chain halogenation there. And the idea is when you go through and do this, that you end up forming a radical here, right? And then you get lots of residents with this. So you end up having, um, uh, in the end, just two products. So the, the resonance, just to point out, with the radical in the ring, that ring is never going to lose its aromaticity. So it's just that position where we're going to react. Now, um, because that's a chiral center, we end up getting a mixture of two products. In this case, they happen to be an antimers of each other. Well, chlorination is less selective than bromination. So if you chlorinated this, then you would have the potential to chlorinate at other positions. Um, uh, it turns out that when you chlorinate this molecule, you end up getting, um, if we take this molecule, abbreviate like this, if we use chlorination here, with a little bit of light, what you end up getting is end up getting a mixture of an antimer similar to that of um, the bromine situation, but you also get that guy too. Um, and you look it up, this is about 44%, this is about 56%. All right, but with bromination, that's not going to happen because it's more um, selective at tertiary and allylic. This is an allylic position than chlorination is. Now we saw this one, I mentioned this one in a previous lecture, but this is Clemenson reduction. So this takes a deactivated meta-directing substituent and turns it into an activating um, OP director. So that's the other reaction that's important. And then there's a fourth one that I wanna just throw in here with you guys. And the, the fourth reaction is something that we see in the textbook and in the problems and it involves the nitro group. So um, what we see for this is hydrochloric acid and iron, right? Or there's a couple other flavors of this thing. You can have HCl with amalgamated zinc. A lot of times students like to use that because it's the same as the Clemenson reduction. R HCl and 10 chloride. Um, and in the end, what you end up getting is your nitro group turns into an amino group. Now, nucleophilic aromatic substitution is the second big reaction in this chapter. So the, the two big ones are EAS and NAS. 
It turns out that nucleophiles can displace halide ions. These are good leaving groups, right? Halide ions are good leaving groups. From aryl halides, if two things are met. Number one, you have strong electron withdrawing groups bound to the ring located ortho para to the halide. So ortho para are best, but we'll see the reaction can occur with only ortho or only para. And then the other thing is that we need to have a strong base. Right? Um, so there's two type of bases that we'll see. One is um, going to be stronger than the other. So sodium hydroxide and sodium amide. So um, let's take a look down below at the reaction. So let's take a look first at addition elimination. So that, that's our first reaction here. So with addition elimination, um, as the name implies, the first thing that happens is we see an addition. So here we have hydroxide as your base, or the nucleophile. So that's going to come over and grab a hold of that carbon. This, just to highlight for you, remember, that is your leaving group. Okay. So once that comes in and attacks here, you're going to end up with a negative charge on the ring. So this is different because in the EAS reaction, that was a positive charge. So here we have a negative charge. Okay, now the reason why we want to have these electron withdrawing groups, ortho and para, is because when we have that negative charge here, it's actually a resonance stabilized by the nitrogen that's of the nitro group because recall that has a positive charge. So every time we're adjacent with this negative next to the, the nitrogen, we end up having this additional resonance structure. So it goes out of the ring. Right here it comes back into the ring. So right moving back down, we would take our electrons, come around and do that. Right? Um, and then again, now we can go out of the ring. Right? So we would come down here just like that, and then they would shift in the nitro group. And then we can pop back down here, right, to give us um, this guy. Okay. So those that I underline are additional resonance structures that, that we get from having those electron withdrawing groups, ortho and para to the leaving group. So in that situation, you, you get the best reaction because you're doubly stabilized because you go out of the ring two times. And then the last step of this reaction is that you have your um, electrons coming over here, reforming your alkene. So that gives you your aromatic ring back and then we kick off bromide to be left with this. Now, side note, because you're in the presence of um, hydroxide, and this is a phenolic OH, this has a pK of about 10. So with that, that'll get deprotonated pretty quickly to form phenol phenoxide. But that's easy to fix with an acid workup. Okay, so with that acid workup, then you just go ahead and you get back your OH. And then you have your two nitro groups still on there. All right. Now, the other reaction is called the elimination addition mechanism. It's also known as the benzyne mechanism. So uh, benzyne, you have bens here because you have a benzene ring and the ine because of a carbon-carbon triple bond. So it's an interesting reaction. So let's let's work our way through understanding it a little bit more. So we know that we can form phenol commercially. Um, it's a known reaction by the reaction of sodium hydroxide with chlorobenzene. So you put sodium hydroxide in there. Um, the one thing that should stand out to you though is this is quite hot. So 350 degrees Celsius is a very high temperature. So this is an industrial synthesis. It's not something that we would do on paper for multi-step or, or something that we would see that often even for predicting products, for example. And the same thing can happen down here below um, with aniline. So chlorobenzene can react with sodium amide. Remember sodium amide has a pK of 36. It comes from NH3. Um, and we get a, a, a substituted uh, ring here. 
Now, th this is interesting because this temperature can be much lower than that of the top reaction with sodium hydroxide. So why can the temperature be so much lower? Well, there's some clues. So a clue to this mechanism um, was discovered by looking at this reaction. So in this reaction, we have a leaving group here. And we have toluene, right? So it's a, it's a paratoluene substituted molecule. And NaNH2, NH3. So we know in the end we're going to get an NH2 on our ring. The question is, where is it going to go? Well, it turns out that it shows up both where that carbon of our leaving group is, that's this position, and also adjacent to it. Not only does it, does it show up in both places, but they show up essentially 50-50. So para meaning we're para here and meta here. All right, so there's speculation that in order for this to occur, that you must have gone through some intermediate that had some equal reactivity at this position. So an interesting reaction was devised where they, they suspected that you might have formed this benzene molecule. So what they did is during the course of that reaction, they threw in another reagent, right? A diene in here. And they did a Diels-Alder reaction to see if they could trap the benzene. And they did. So they found evidence of this in the reaction mixture, which therefore meant that benzene must have been formed. So what is benzene? So benzene is um, a molecule that has alternating single and double bonds, but one of those double bonds is a triple bond. Well, let's look at that. So there's a lot of ring strain on that. Let's talk about how that might actually form. So um, overall, looking at this thing, you're starting off with a substituted toluene. So strong base comes in, deprotonates, takes away the hydrogen. Right? And then what we end up with here is a set of electrons. And these electrons right now are in an sp2 orbital. So, um, and that sp2 orbital, remember bromine is also in an sp2 here, right? What happens is those electrons come over here and attack that carbon, and then we kick off bromine there. So it's an interesting type of a pi bond that occurs essentially from the overlap of sp2 orbitals. So it retains sp2 character here. Now because of that, we, we don't typically draw it this way. We often draw it like that. Even though we draw it like that, it's not, those, that triple bond is not from the overlap of all p orbitals. All right, so remember, if, if it was a triple bond, a true triple bond, then you'd want a bond angle of 180 degrees, which is going to put an immense amount of ring strain on that molecule. All right, So that's the first step. Now the second step, you have NH2 coming in, and then with NH2, it can attack this top carbon here, or it can attack the bottom one, so the top shoulder or the bottom. Right? It does that with 50-50 chance. There's no reason why it would attack one more than the other here. So when it does that, you get your sp2 um, electrons back in that orbital. And then the last step is that we grab a proton from NH3 so that we're, uh, that we're protonated at that position. And again, highlighting something really important, 50%, 50%. So that's a, a key thing to understanding um, this reaction overall. Well, the last reaction that I need to show you in this chapter um, shows how we're going to put a um, an aldehyde group on um, a benzene ring. So it turns out that we have to use carbon monoxide. So if we take carbon monoxide here, right, that has a minus charge here and a plus charge there, and you add hydrochloric acid to it, what you get is an HOCl. Right, so this is called a, a 
four mole chloride that can react further when we add AlCl3 and we typically here add copper chloride also uh, but what we form is HC double bond O and then a positive charge here plus AlCl4 so this is going to be your electrophile and then that can undergo your EAS reaction. So last reaction that we need to just mention for this chapter.